So thank you for coming today. I'm going to speak on a topic that um, is a large part of um, some of the investigative work that I do and applies to some of the clinical work that I do as well. And that's looking at motor skill and motor learning deficits in children with autism. And I'm going to discuss some of the findings that we have and discuss throughout the talk um, implications for social skill development for for what looking at these motor features might tell us about the core social and communicative features of autism and also um, touch on throughout the talk but, but in the end discuss some implications for therapeutic intervention um, and some things that we're going to be pursuing and looking to pursue um, as next steps. So I'm going to start at a very theoretical level. Um, this should be evident by the fact that I'm going to show a slide of an amoeba because if I'm showing a slide of an amoeba and this is a lecture on autism, it's sure as heck going to be theoretical um, level that I'm going to be starting at here. But I, I want, I like to talk, start the lectures with this with this slide because it really hits home a, a sort of a central point that I, I think that uh, and framework that I think I want people to to get as before I get into notions of looking at motor skill impairments in autism. And that's it. When we think about um, uh, the amoeba, and, we, and most of us, I guess, learned about amoebas. I remember learning about it in seventh grade science or something like that. And you learn that basically that the amoeba does one of two things. So it extends a pseudopod to envelop food, which is what you're seeing it do here. Um, or it moves the pseudopod in the other direction if it senses some kind of toxin in the environment. And this, this coupling of perception and action is really what, what life is. It's what, what it all boils down to. It's why the amoeba is a living thing and my cell phone, as complicated as it is, is not a living thing. Because my, the amoeba has this ability to dynamically interact with the environment, with the world around it. It has an ability to sense what's in, in the external world, and then in some ways dynamic, some way dynamically interact with that external world. What also makes the amoeba life form is that it can actually propagate itself, it can make more amoebas. Um, but, but that really, that coupling of perception and action is really the basis of what, what is life and what is the nervous system and what the nervous system does in all living things. Um, whether they be animal or plant for that matter, whether they be lower life forms uh, such as the amoeba or higher life forms such as ourselves. So we basically, our nervous system basically does the same kind of thing. Um, we, um, we do it at much more complex levels, but like the amoeba, we sense food in the environment and you know, su substances that we, we want and need and we reach for those things. We sense danger and we get away from those things. And we also obviously engage in much more complex behavior, including social behavior, um, such as demonstrated here, um, and as well as sort of more complex cognitive behavior, um, as demonstrated here by Gary Kasparov playing chess. And if you think about Gary Kasparov playing chess and what he's doing as he's sitting there at the chessboard, he's in his own mind mapping out a series of movements or possible movements that he and the person he's playing against or possibly the computer he's playing against um, I think it's a person here because there's an American flag so I'll assume it's an American uh, person um, uh, is, you know what what are the series of moves that they might might um, engage in what you know what is drastically different about us versus the amoeba of course is that we are able to in, engage in much more complex um, sequences of, of actions that, that um, make up our behavior. And a large part of that is mapping forward in time. The amoeba has no ability really to map forward in time. It senses and it reacts in a very immediate sense. We have an ability, much more so than any other species roaming the planet, to, to really map forward in time and map our actions in time and forward in time as both uh, sorry, I should say both forward and past. And that allows us to do much more, engage in much more complicated behavior. But basically, at the core of all of this is this linking of perception and action. Um, so in our brains, um, oh, do we have a pointer, by the way? I guess not, or maybe it's under the below. Uh, I'll check. I don't think so. No, I guess I'll use my, my trusty finger as a pointer. 
So we, um, and is it okay if I walk away from the microphone? Is that going to mess up the recording? All right. So we, um, we have much more complicated sensory units um, here in the brain, occupying sort of the posterior aspects of the brain um, and the temporal lobes, as well as then sort of the motor unit, um, the frontal lobe of the brain, um, that is hierarchically organized from the most posterior part of the motor, of the motor, uh, of, sorry, the frontal lobes being the primary motor cortex important for just the actual execution of actions. And then in shown here in um, <clears throat> lighter gray, premotor cortex critical for sort of sequencing and selecting those actions. Um, and then prefrontal cortex, important also for sequencing and selecting actions, but really much more in sort of organizing in a higher level of organizing and planning our, our behavior. And so with this, we create, we couple these sort of perceptual and action systems and create these internal um, models of action or behavior. Um, so that, that we have these models in our mind so that when we go back to do things like me standing here talking or um, or any other kinds of behaviors that we don't have to sort of recreate it all over again. We sort of form these models of how to do these things based on what we're sensing in the environment. So I'm now right here standing sensing that there is an audience and it is 11.45 and I'm supposed to be talking right now and so I engage in these actions and this slide is up on the screen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, sort of another schematic um, sort of demonstrating this hierarchy is uh, we have these sort of links and sort of <coughs> short range connections and I'm going to come back to sort of notions of the short range versus long range connections. Short range connections um, important for coupling sort of basic sensory and motor uh, behavior. Longer range connections with premotor cortex and then even longer range connections in the brain um, that get established later as the child develops, uh, as people develop, that are important for um, really high order organization of behavior, things that are sometimes referred to as executive function. And we have influences from subcortical regions, mainly the basal ganglia, that influence all of these systems at, at all level levels, and, and that's sort of important for reward-based modulation. Um, so modulating <coughs> these, this coupling of perception and action based on the sensing of reward. Um, and uh, the most important reward being success, that you actually sort of are successful at doing something. And then cerebellar are impor cerebellum important for modulating things based on detection of errors. So in autism, we have these core features. This is going to get jumbled a little bit when the DSM-5 comes out. I don't have to make a new slide, but at this point, I'm going to use the DSM-4 slide. Uh, this sort of core features of social interact impairments of social interaction, communication, stereotype patterns of behavior, and I presume you're all very familiar with that. And um, you know what is then now increasingly recognized, but not sort of as part of the core features necessarily, is that many of these children have impairments in motor function. Um, and what I'm going to talk about over the course of this talk is the notions about the interrelationships. Number one, I'll talk about the, the types of motor dysfunction that these children present with. And number two, the interrelationships of these motor functions with these core social and communicative impairments. Now, I, I have this slide up here. Um, this is my uh, now 11-year-old, 11-and-a-half-year-old uh, son um, at two-and-a-half years of age uh, pedaling a tricycle. So I have this slide up, first of all, because it's nice because I like to show pictures of my children but also because um, it demonstrates, it reminds me to discuss this something that is sort of at a very clinical level we often see in children with autism. Which is that I, when I see, when I talk to parents of children with autism, I often hear that in, in the course of their motor development, that they tend to um, acquire more basic motor skills. Typically on time there are exceptions, but they tend to sit up on time and, and walk on time. Uh, but when they have to learn more complex sequences of movements, pedaling, pumping their legs on a swing, various fine motor skills, dressing skills, etc., that's when things break down. That's when they tend to have more, more difficulty. Um, so the question can be raised, um, why study motor function in autism? I mean, it is, I mean, the core features are, as described, social and communicative impairments. So what are the potential advantages to study motor function in autism? So I list some of those here. 
First of all, motor signs can serve as markers for deficits in parallel brain systems important for development of socialization, communication, and other higher order behaviors. So I've sort of created a theory, I've established some theoretical framework as to why that's the case, but I'll go into further into that as, as, as we progress in the talk. And the anatomic and physiologic basis of motor function is well understood. So yes, I mean, the first point is nice, but one can still say, well, but still, why study motor function? Why not just, you know, sure they develop in parallel, um, but, but why not focus on social studying function? social and communicative function. What's the advantage of studying motor function? Well, the advantage is, is that we understand the, the anatomic and physiologic basis, basis of motor skill function and much, to much greater detail than we understand the, the neurologic basis of more complex behavior. So it can give us a window then into, and also it's, it's, it's easier, it's, it, there's ease and precision that's not achievable with more complex behavior. So it can give us a window into understanding the neurologic basis of autism. It can give us an understanding, and as I pointed out in the last points here, nature of the behavioral impairments in the brain, basis of the impairments in autism, and actually point to uh, potential roads for effective therapeutic interventions. This, this has been highlighted. I'm not going to go into detail on this, but I sort of throw up this slide to just sort of say that this notion of motor models of social behavior generally and, and potentially is relevant to autism has been highlighted by a number of people under notions of sort of embodied cognition or embodied simulation or an active mind. And just basically that, that, that by looking at the motor system we can gain insights into um, difficulties with higher order social and cognitive development. So, um, with that, I want to also um, mention that one sort of basis of what I'm going to talk about is that many that when we think about development for children as opposed to adults, um, so it's my so children as opposed to adult contrasting slide, we have to think about what are the processes that contribute to the development of these skills. Okay, so. In adults, when there, are, when there are motor problems, those motor problems are often due to, or motor problems develop, new motor problems develop, they develop because there's a lesion to the system, there's, whether it be degenerative or, or acute, like a stroke, that results in a motor impairment. But in children, it's because there's something different about the way the system develops. And so we have to think about the processes that underlie the acquisition of these skills and so there'll be some emphasis, as you'll see in the talk, on motor skill learning. And I'm going to talk about how that contributes to both the motor skill deficits um, that we see in autism, as well as the core impairments. So the general outline after that long introduction oops, is that I'm going to talk about, let's go backwards, I'm going to talk about the behavior initially, some of the core behavioral problems that we see. I'm going to talk about some issues about the neurologic basis, some notions about the neurologic basis, and then talk about some notions about therapeutic intervention. So, first of all, many individuals with autism demonstrate problems with basic motor control. Problems with gait, posture, balance, speed, coordination. I threw up a few, men, mention of a few um, studies that have supported this. There, I, there are dozens more studies that support these, the, the presence of these abnormalities. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on these, but I just want to mention that. Now, I throw up a slide, a picture there too of Donald Gray Triplett. Um, does anybody know who Donald Gray Triplett is? I think he's still alive. So Donald Gray Triplett was the first person described with autism. So um, uh, in Leo Kanner's original discussion in 1943, is the original presentation of autism, he is case, you know, case number one. And it's, Atlantic Magazine, I believe it was, if I want to give right credit, I believe it was Atlantic Magazine, um, did an article about him a few years back. And he actually, at least at that point, was still living in Mississippi in a small town. And what was interesting, there were a lot, a lot of interesting things about the article. They discussed some issues about adult transition and you know what he's been doing as an adult and his, the community support that has allowed him to, uh, provided him um, a, uh, a comfortable and um, and stimulating and uh, 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 contributory <laughs> life, but also 
what's interesting about what some of the interesting things that I picked up in reading the article is it talks, it, they follow him around for a day or so, and they, there's this moment where he goes to play golf. And they talk about some very odd gait patterns that he has and odd swing that he has. And so they talk about actually some of the motor abnormalities that he has. So even in Leo Kanner's first case, we're sort of seeing these, these difficulties. Um, uh, let me actually skip this. I don't want to get into too much detail, but basically, this is just a summary slide that, that shows that for, um, for children with autism, we found that, that at a high degree of certainty, we can distinguish children with autism for, from typically developing children based on problems with, with uh, gait, balance, movement speed, and some other motor signs. But what's, what's, what's a caveat about these problems of basic motor control with, with being able to do control movements like, like your gait and your balance and your, your fine motor coordination is that those signs are not necessarily specific to children with autism. So we see that these problems are present in other children with other types of disorders. So we have in, in this slide um, a study of, uh, and this is from a study published last year, we have children with autism um, on the far right in black, and then children with ADHD in red, and then typically developing children in blue. And this is on a motor battery called the PANES, where the higher the score, um, the worse the performance. And as you can see, the children with autism perform the worst, although the children with ADHD nearly match them in terms of the severity of the impairment on, on this motor battery. And you see the scores listed below such that both the children with autism and the children with ADHD performed significantly worse than the typically developing children. Okay, and there was no difference, at least in this sample, of 20, there were 24 children in each group between the children with autism and the children with ADHD. Now, with larger numbers, we would start to see some, some <coughs> significant differences, but, but the main point is, is that clearly the children with autism and children with ADHD have at least to some degree similar levels of impairment in basic motor control. So the other thing that I want to move on to and, and, and spend more time discussing is a feature that seems to be more specific to autism, which is impairment in their ability to perform more, more complex skills and gestures. Um, and this sort of coincides with the notions of what I talked about in terms of their development um, and when things really break down. So there have been a number of studies that have reported impairments in skilled motor performance. I'll list some of them down there. Um, this is. Uh, this is impairments in imitation of, of people doing these kind of gestures, as well as deficits and also pantomime, which means basically that the person says, instructs uh, the, the child um, to, to perform certain acts, like show me how you comb your hair, or show me how you use a scissors, or show me how you brush your teeth, um, as well as when we actually just give them those tools and we watch them, observe them, perform those actions. And this is a highly robust um, and reproducible finding. It's been seen in many, many studies, including several from our laboratory. And this has led to notions of ideas or contributed to ideas that autism may be associated with a developmental dyspraxia. And I'll explain praxis um, here. So the main type of uh, dyspraxia is an ideomotor praxis, which refers to the ability to perform these learned skill motor actions. So you have, you have Basically, in general sense, two types of actions. You have communicative gestures, which is intransitive because they're not acting on the tool. So here's Waldo demonstrating a very common type of, of communicative gesture, waving hello or goodbye. Um, as well as then uh, tool use um, or transitive gestures. So those are some of the ones like, that I described. So you have here a um, demonstration of somebody hammering. So we've described across several studies now this impairment in this slide you have gestures to command, gestures to imitation, gestures with actual tool use. And, and the children, the typically developing children are the open circles um, at the top and the percent correct is on the y-axis. And you see that the typically developing children are performing much better than children with autism across all three, um, gesture to command, gesture to imitation, tool use. This is from the first study we published on this in 2006. We've published three studies since in fairly non-overlapping samples of children with autism and typically developed children. And we see these robust impairments consistently. Furthermore, uh, oops, we see that unlike what we saw with basic impairments in basic motor control, we don't see these impairments as much in other populations. And so here we have children with ADHD 
And you can see that we're not seeing the impairments um, in children with ADHD. So we have percent correct on the y-axis, so the higher the number, the better the performance. And you can see that the children with ADHD perform on average about 73% correct, and typically developing children 79, 80% correct. So yeah, there's a little bit of difficulty with the children with ADHD, but it's not significantly different from the typically developing children. Um, and what's more is the children with autism who perform at much worse levels, about 56% on average, are performing significantly worse compared to both the children with, eight, uh, with sorry, excuse me, for both the children with, eight, with the typically developing children as well as the children with ADHD. So we're seeing some sense that this kind of impairment is, appears to be specific to autism. <coughs> So what's important about praxis is, and the notion of praxis, is that when children learn these gestures over time, when they, you know, when they watch other people do these things and, and, and imitate and incorporate and develop these own, their own action models, they're not only learning to perform the skills, they're also learning to understand and recognize the skills in others. So if I stand up here right now and I do this, you know what I'm doing. If I ask you, what am I doing? You know, you, I, don't, I won't ask you, I won't be surprised about this. You know I'm, I'm hammering a nail, right? And when I do this, you know I'm brushing my teeth. Because you have your own internal model in your mind of how you do these things. And then when you see other people do them, you reference that and you're able to recognize the gesture. And so we, so actually the point here then is that the brain uses the same internal action models to, to perform skilled actions as, um, um, well, our second point, as, um, as skilled and social communicative actions. So the same thing can be said for, that I'm demonstrating for tool use can be said for social and communicative gestures. Now of course these include sort of basic communicative gestures such as things like waving goodbye, um, but also just sort of the more subtle communicative gestures. So I can look around the room right now um, and tell who's really interested in the talk and who's maybe not so interested in the talk, and that's not to put anybody on notice, but I actually I see a room full of people who look interested in the talk, which is good. So, um, and that's because I, can, I know what those facial expressions mean in part because I myself understand when I make certain facial expressions that it's associated with an emotional cognitive state in myself. And again, so then I'm able to reference that that in internal action model when I when I look at you. So it suggests that there might be some association between praxis and and the social commutative impairments in autism, or the dyspraxia in the social commutative impairments in autism. And sure enough, we've seen um, this has been seen across studies, but I'm reporting in one from one study here, the second study that we reported on praxis, um, Juke et al. 2007, that we see a fairly robust correlation such that the higher the, the ADOS score, um, um, the autism diagnostic observation schedule, and higher scores reflect increased impairment, the, the lower the practice, or a better way to put it, the lower the practice score, um, the lower the practice, the poorer the practice performance, the higher the ADOS score, suggesting that there, it may very well be this association. And it raises the question whether or not in autism, or at least for a particular subset of children with autism, and it may not just be the high-functioning children with autism, I would suggest that it might be nonverbal children with autism as well, that, that is there a dyspraxia for social skills? In other words, is there an impaired acquisition and development of the internal models necessary to know how to engage in social interaction? Um, I would submit that this is sort of what contributes to the, the, the shake hand diagnosis in autism. So the clinicians out there, as well as other people, know that you know when we evaluate children for, for autism, we do we go through various approaches. So, you know, we use the ADOS, we use various questionnaires and rating scales, but a lot of what we do is really just sort of clinical impression. And it's still considered the gold standard approach for diagnosing autism is 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 clinical impression, clinician impression. And a lot of that really, you get a sense of that very quickly. And this notion of shake hand diagnosis, that really very quickly you get a sense, like upon meeting the person, you sort of get a sense of, of whether they have autism or not. I'm not saying it's, it's that simple, and it's by far not that simple in, in many cases, but there are many, many situations where that is the case. And I would submit that what you're really sensing upon that initial interaction is, how good is this person at social interaction? How good are their social skills? How praxic or how dyspraxic are they for social skills?
And when you when you get a sense really quickly that yeah, you think that the person sort of is on the spectrum, that's because you're sensing that that they're not so good at this particular skill. Um, so I'm going to touch on the neurologic basis quickly. Um, there is, you know, I talked about the coupling of sensory and motor, and there is this is this is very much the case in praxis. So in learning these these skills, it's been known practice. Dyspraxia, or as it referred to in adults, apraxia, was first described by Sherrington in the early, early 1900s. And it, it's described and been well known from lesion studies in adults over the years that you can get praxis by, by a lesion in the sort of sensory um, system, particularly in inferior parietal regions, where it's thought that these representations, the sensory spatial temporal representations of the movement are stored. Or you can get, uh, and particularly in the left hemisphere, or you could get develop dyspraxia, acquire dyspraxia in adults. If, if there's a lesion to the premotor regions in the left hemisphere, they're responsible for then taking those sensory representations and modeling the sequence of actions that are necessary to perform, and that sends a signal then to primary motor cortex, which then moves the limb. Um, or you can get it through a disconnection between these two. Well, interestingly enough, this exact, in recent sort of emphasis on imitation and the notion of mirror neuron system, which you may have heard about it's being emphasized in, in autism, this, is, this, this coupling is, been, is exactly overlapped. So the same system, the same coupling between inferior parietal and premotor that has been discussed as being crucial for practice for over 100 years now has also been, in, in recent decades, been emphasized in, in imitation, um, in what's necessary to actually imitate others. And so it may be that this coupling, that, that it, through imitation and then practice, that the linking of these two systems is necessary for, for, for developing these internal models or action of behavior, necessary for performing these kinds of skills, these skilled actions. And so there has been this emphasis on mirror neuron hypothesis, um, and I've discussed some of this already, that the representation of the motor plans um, uh, and their sensory feedback is what sort of is, is engendered in this internal action model, and that this, the brain uses the same internal action model to perform skilled motor actions, um, including those actions necessary to social commutative behavior, and that the brain uses this internal model, action model um, in a feed-forward manner I, I won't get into sort of the explanation of what feed forward means, but basically to understand the intents of others. In other words, what you're doing is when you're seeing, when you're looking at me, when you look at other people, and you, under, you, you try to get a sense of what they're doing and understand the meaning of their actions, that you're mapping their actions onto your own internal representations of those actions. Okay, and this is what contributes to what's called action understanding, and, and what contributes to theory of mind. I mean, this theory of mind is this concept that's been emphasized by various autism investigators um, as being potentially a core impairment in autism, this ability to understand what other people are thinking or feeling. And so that this internal the linking, the sensory uh, motor link, linking is important for the development of these internal models of action, and that's critical to developing an ability to perform these skilled actions as well as understand others' actions so that um, it raises the question in children with autism is, well, okay, they're dyspraxic and they can't perform these skills very well. Are they good at recognizing these skills in others? And we've actually looked at that by using something called a postural knowledge test and we have children um, look at images, and this has been used in the adult um, uh, apraxia literature, and so we have children um, look at, uh, at pictures such as this and then identify what's the correct hand gesture. Um, and children with autism actually do show impairments in this. Um, we first reported this in 2009, um, and so they perform worse. Their total correct is worse. Um, you have autism on the left and typically developing children on the right. Um, and furthermore, <coughs> once again, just like what we saw with performing these kinds of skilled actions, we don't see this impairment so much in children with ADHD. We only see this impairment really in children with autism. So it suggests that there's some specificity. So that in autism, we not only have an impairment in the ability to perform, as I'm showing on the right here, with, by discussing praxis, the ability to perform these skilled kind of actions, we also have a problem with the ability to recognize these actions in others. And I would submit that that parallels 
what we're seeing at the social level. That we, in children with autism, we not only see an impairment in the ability to perform these social skills, we're also seeing an impairment in their ability to understand and be aware of these skills as these actions as performed by others. And I would submit that these things are, the development of these things are inextricably um, linked. So, from a developmental standpoint, I've been hinting at this throughout uh, the talk so far, um, and I mentioned this earlier, that, that it's obviously important to think about the learning process that, con that contributes, might be contributing to the impaired formation of these action models and leading to um, and contributing to motor skill deficits as well as deficits in social and communicative, beha communicative behavior. So, in thinking about learning and memory, this is an overly um, simplified slide, but it actually is fairly accurate in the sense that learning and memory are divided into two basic components okay, um, in the human brain. There is declarative learning and procedural learning. So, Declarative learning is the conscious or explicit learning of facts and events. So something like the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. You memorize this at some point. It's almost become proceduralized now because you've said it so many times or maybe thought about it so many times, at least I have, that, that it's, you know, that you could say it without thinking, so to speak. But it is, it is, was originally learned because you memorized it at some point in, you know, some, in elementary school or something. But the thing about declarative learning is that that's good is that it's flexible. So if I spend a, a time here, this lecture, uh, 45 minutes or something, convincing you that no, I have really good evidence that the Declaration of Independence was not signed in 1776, it was actually signed in 1775, um, and then gave you a test on it, and you knew I was the one grading the test, that you would, you would, you know, and you had multiple choice, you would choose 1775. Um, because you were very easily able to kick out that fact and, the fact and replace it with another, okay? The problem with declarative learning, though, is that flexibility engenders the fact that it's also um, fleeting. That it's, it's, you know, we've all had this, you know, we've studied for tests and you memorize a bunch of things and then like a week later you can't remember half of what you memorized. Um, procedural learning, on the other hand, the good thing about it is, is that it's, it's not so transient. It's like riding a bike. You know, it's a, so motor skill learning is sort of the core of procedural learning, and it is, um, it, once you learn it, it's sort of very, very ingrained. The problem with it is, is that it, it is less flexible. I like to tell the story that I learned to swim at a very young age, and then about three or four years ago, maybe longer, I started, I started taking swimming lessons. But before that, my wife started taking swimming lessons, um, and I was actually just swimming in the pool. I swim over at Meadowbrook. Um, and when I'm out of town, I like to say, I swim at the Michael Phelps pool. Um, so I swim at, at Meadowbrook, and, um, and there's this instructor, for anybody who goes there, you would know Miss Annie. And so Miss Annie was instructing um, my wife, actually, and I happened to be swimming a few legs over, and Annie didn't know that we were, we were married. And so Lori's swimming, and, she's, she, and Annie's trying to tell her like sort of ways that she should and shouldn't swim, and she points over to me, and she says, now you see that guy over there? Don't swim like him at all. Like that's really bad. And so I, you know, the thing is now that I've taken lessons. That was before I started taking lessons, and now I com I participate in a class, and Annie actually has uh, and others have instructed me, and my my stroke has gotten much better. But it took a long time. I mean, because these motor patterns were very ingrained, and I and to overcome them takes a lot. And I would submit that that's true for social interaction as well. I mean, you learn a pattern of interaction, learn a pattern of behavior. It sort of becomes part of your quote unquote personality. And, and to sort of change those kinds of patterns, is, it, it takes a lot um, in order to do so. Um, so I submit and I think, that, I think that I've made a reasonable case that <coughs> procedural learning and social skills are likely linked. If you think about how you learn social skills, you really don't memorize a lot of things. Yes, your mom sort of maybe tells you or your dad tells you to say please, say thank you, and you memorize those things, and hopefully you actually proceduralize those things. But, but mostly you learn social skills by being around other people, beginning at a very young age, and watching their behavior, and then in, imitating that, and incorporating that, and forming your own internal action models um, that, that, um, that comprise your behavior. 
Interestingly, individuals with autism, um, as many of you know, often report an inabet inability to automatically perform these kinds of social gestures, and report they compensate by using declarative scripts. So when I first met Temple Grandin about 15 years ago or so, she, she told me that when she was, and I think she's probably maybe overcome this to some degree since, but she said to me that when she got into a social situation and somebody stuck out their hand to shake her hand, she would actually have to call up this kind of script in her mind that said, oh, this person is sticking out their hand, I'm now supposed to stick out my hand, that there was a lack of ability to sort of really learn this in an automatic fashion. And this has also been emphasized in various models, such as uh, the inactive mind model from um, Ami Klin. So I'm going to talk about a particular motor learning test. We've had a few studies on this, and I'm going to talk about the most recent study. We had a study published on this um, a while back, uh, a few years ago, um, that was kind of a really big breakthrough study. But we've done a follow-up study since then, which I think much more easily and concisely explains the, the finding. And the, this, our finding from the more recent study is completely consistent from this, with this original study. So I want to I wanna discuss this finding, and I think this really is giving us a clue into what may be the particular problem that children with autism have when they're learning these skills. So what we have in this case, we do this, so this is a laboratory environment, so it's a very sort of constrained kind of learning um, that we're looking at. This is Courtney Haswell, who, published the, who was the first author in the original publication. Um, she's a, a student in the laboratory at the time. Um, and so what, what Courtney's doing, what the children do, is they grab, they grip this joystick. They don't actually see the joystick, as you can see. What they see is, um, you really can't tell, it looks like a table, but there's a computer screen here, okay? And they see a cursor that exactly matches the position of where, wherever you move the joystick, the cursor goes, okay? At least that's the way it's programmed initially. And they see a target, and they're supposed to, the very, very straightforward task. Just when, when the target appears, move the joystick to the target as fast as you can, and if you can move it, get it there within, within a second or so, then, then it blows up and you get, you see money come out and you get, you know, so it's rewarding. We actually made a game out of it initially where they had to like capture animals in a zoo, so they had to like move to the target until the animals have escaped and they move to the target and they capture the animals and to make it a little more fun for them. So what, what we see is, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell the most important thing. <laughs> so. What happens in this experiment, though, is that as they're moving to the target, there's a force perturbation applied to the joystick, or applied to the robotic arm and the joystick, so their arm gets moved to the side. So when they initially start to move to the, first of all, they do a bunch of trials where they just sort of practice, and there's no force perturbation, they just sort of learn how to move the robot. And we make sure that they could do that okay. So then there's a force perturbation applied, and when that's applied, their arm gets moved, um, actually, in this experiment, it's moved this way. So force perturbation is applied and, and moves their arm to the left. And then they have to learn to compensate. Okay, they have to learn to adapt their movement and apply sort of a counter force as they're moving so they can actually hit the target. And they, they do that over time. And, and actually, um, so you see here, and we've done this actually in children with autism and children with ADHD. You see here typically developing children, Children with autism, children with ADHD, okay? And what we see is that you see initially, early on, all three groups, you see about the same kind of perturbation. You know, their arm gets kicked out to the, to the left, and then they have to sort of move back to hit the target. By the middle or so of the, these trials, there's like a few dozen trials, they really, the typically developing children and the children with ADHD are, are hitting the target. The autism children take a little bit longer to, to to get there, but they do eventually get there and eventually all adapt their movements just fine. So you see actually here the learning curves. So we have here trials um, 0 to 20, and you see that fairly quickly all three groups adapt. The children with autism, shown here in red, are a little bit slower, but, but they get there and they eventually adapt, adapt fine. Now, um, I will say as an aside, there is sort of this separate finding in children with ADHD, which you can tell right away if you look carefully at the slide, is that the children with ADHD are much more variable. Actually, more, much more variable than children with autism. And that, that's a whole side discussion about, about increased variability in ADHD, and it's interesting that this study showed this as well. Um, all right, so what we did, though, is we said, look, is there something different about the way that they're learning? Is there something different about, remember I talked about the amoeba, I talked about the coupling of perception and action. So when you're learning this movement, and frankly, when you're learning to use 
movement to do movements of of your limbs particularly of your upper your hands and arms particularly. Um, and let's I, I also want to point out let's remember that uh, I forgot to mention this earlier is that when you think about communicative impairments in children with autism, it's not just that there's a language impairment that these children almost always there's there's delays in development of gestural communication as well, pointing and use of more complex gestures such as waving goodbye. So. You think about how they learn these kind of things. There's two main sensory um, inputs that guide these movements. Right? One is proprioception. Okay? So some of you in the room know what proprioception is, but I imagine that, that there's a number of you who don't necessarily know what proprioception is, so you're closest, so I'm going to ask you to stand up for a second. So this is what so proprioception is the sense you get from your muscles of where your limbs are. So give me your hand, okay? Just relax. Okay, I'm going to move your close your eyes, I'm going to move your thumb up or down and tell me which way I'm moving your thumb. So, all 100% correct. So, so, so this system is really good. This is why if I close my eyes, I can touch my finger to my nose. So you, you have a sense of where your limbs are in space because of feedback from your muscles, okay? So anytime we move, we, this, we get this feedback, okay? The other main sensory input that we get, you would have been much more confident if, about which way I was moving your thumb, if. My uh, eyes were. Exactly, so the vision. All right. So auditory limb movement, not so much. True for, for, for mouth movements, but let's, we won't go there for now. But limb movements and then smell, not so much. Um, but, but proprioception and, or uh, really not at all with smell, but proprioception and, and, um, and, uh, and vision are really key. So what we did is, in this next experiment, we, we, de we decoupled vision and proprioception. So, for example, while they were moving to the target, um, straight ahead, they got this force permission, in this case actually pushing them to the right, okay? But yet, they saw something completely different. So instead, they got moved to the right um, here, three different, three different levels of force. But the visual trajectory, maybe it matched what they saw, but maybe it didn't match what they saw, or what they felt, rather. So the, the starkest example is we had these times where they were being pushed to the right, but yet they saw a straight path to the target, okay? So you have this decoupling of the visual and sensory feedback that's being provided. So what we found in, is, interestingly, and this actually is consistent with the previous experiment that I'm, I, I'm not going to go into in the interest of time, is that the typically developing children were much more impacted by this decoupling than were the, uh, the children with autism. So that, the, the, that when you had zero visual error, meaning you saw a straight line, but you had these three different levels of proprioceptive error being pushed to the right three different, uh, to three different degrees, you saw that the, the change in force, this is a measure of the learning, was, was was much better in children with autism than it was in typically developing children. And I will tell you when we reverse this. When, so when we calculate visual, uh, proprioceptive sensitivity, we see the children with autism show much higher proprioceptive sensitivity. When we calculate visual sensitivity, we find that the children with autism show much lower visual sensitivity. Okay, so lower visual sensitivity, higher proprioceptive sensitivity. In, we've done this also in children with ADHD. The children with ADHD are basically more or less looking like the typically developing children. Okay, so this seems to be specific to autism. We're seeing a pattern of learning that suggests that when learning novel movements, the children with autism are relying to a greater degree on proprioceptive feedback from their own internal bodies, from their own internal world, and less on visual feedback from the external world. Okay? This makes sense heuristically, obviously, when you think about autism and what autism, like why Leo Kanner even called it autism to begin with. This is that this whole notion of they're in their own world, and when they're m developing these models of behavior, both their own behavior and the understanding of, you know, that help that provides a basis for understanding the world around them, they seem to be relying to a greater degree on feedback from their own internal system, from their own internal world, and less what's going on in the external world. Um, what's more then, and this is not surprising, is that we find that, um, that this, this across typically developing children, 
that this pattern predicts imitation ability. So that the more you tend to rely on proprioception, the, the less and, and less you rely on vision, the, the more impaired you are in imitating others. Of course, because imitation depends on, you can't learn, you can't get imitation feedback through, through proprioception. It's coming to you visually, right? And we also see this actually, this association for other aspects of praxis, gestures of command, just as a tool use, probably because that's how those things are being developed to begin with. Um, furthermore, we find this associated with social impairment. So here we have the ADOS, social interaction score from the ADOS, and the more, the more bias there was to, towards proprioception, the higher the ADOS score, the worse their performance on the ADOS. Um, and also we see this with the social response in the scale. So, there is the sense then that an autism is associated with, um, with anomalous patterns of motor development or dyspraxia, that they show a bias towards reliance on proprioceptive rather than visual feedback to guide internal models of formation of internal models of action. In other words, to guide the way they learn motor skills. Um, and that this bias seems to uh, predict and be associated with impairments in motor as well as social function in, the, in these children. So what we want to understand a little bit more now and what we're moving into is looking at the neural mechanisms um, um, and the notion that, first of all, <coughs> that, that these the, the impaired development of this internal action model, these internal action models, these impaired motor learning may not only contribute to how you learn the skills themselves, but also um, how you understand others. Um, as well as then, um, and looking to, so looking to the neural basis of that, as well as looking to treatment implications. So I think I'm running out of time. I'm going to talk, I'm just going to mention quickly in, in, in a few minutes here, number one, um, I'll just take like one minute to talk about the neurology of this. Many of you might be aware that there's this increased emphasis in autism. Um, there are a number of findings that suggest that in autism that there may be an overgrowth of low, uh, local connectivity and an undergrowth of, of more long-range connectivity. And if you think about sensory motor coupling that I just that I just discussed, proprioceptive and motor. Proprioceptive is encoded um, is encoded um, here right adjacent to the motor cortex. So you have this more localized coupling that's ne necessary for proprioceptive motor links, as opposed to visual motor, which is dependent upon more distant connectivity. So it may be that this overgrowth of local connectivity and uh, relative undergrowth of, of, of more long-range connectivity is what is underlying this, this bias towards, uh, towards reliance on proprioception. This is thought to contribute to this overgrowth of local connectivity. It's thought to be one of the things that may be contributing to the increased head size in autism early on. Um, interestingly, we find that, that the volume of white matter in typically developed children, we published this a few years ago, um, several years ago, the for typically developing children, the larger the white matter, the, the better the motor in the primary motor cortex, the better the motor performance, whereas in children with autism, we saw the complete opposite that the larger the lo this localized white matter connections in the, in the, in the motor cortex, the worse the, the motor performance, the, or the higher the score on the PANS. We're also using some, some state-of-the-art functional connectivity techniques um, to isolate motor networks and visual networks. Really what I want to emphasize here is that we see some particularly distinct differences in children with autism, and particularly that this sort of, this particular visual and motor network are decreased in children with autism, and this decrease is actually predictive of their social impairment, um, so that the, the higher this, actually I just focus on the left hand side, the higher this, this connectivity, uh, 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 sorry, the, uh, yeah, sorry, focus on the right hand side, I meant to say. The, lo the lower the connectivity between the visual and motor network, then the, uh, the higher their, their SRS score, the more their social impairment. Um, and we're also seeing this with praxis and imitation as well. So that the higher the, um, the connectivity, the, or the lower the connectivity, the worse the performance on those. So what I really wanted for this group, what I for a few more minutes of your time, what I want to talk about is sort of what are the therapeutic implications. So, if we think about teaching skills to children with autism, and I'm going to talk about teaching motor skills as well as social skills, 
then this may, this, what, these findings may inform us in, in a number of ways. Number one, it may inform us that one of the things we might want to consider is playing to the strength of children with autism. So if they're better at relying on proprioceptive feedback, maybe then we use that. We use that to our advantage and use more hands-on approaches to, to teach them skills. So a good example of this is Pam Maffey um, is a speech language pathologist here, and um, she tells me, although I don't think this has been published yet, from um, a postdoctoral thesis from New Mexico State where she was previously, they looked at sign language in children with autism and how to teach sign language. And if you think about how you teach sign language, typically it's through visual motor input, right? You have them imitate. Um, so I, I sign in time with Alex and Leah, is that familiar for anybody? That's a video that sometimes people use. But, but basically you show them signs and you teach them how to, how to perform these signs. Um, that's the, 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 the standard traditional approach. But what they also did was actually take the children with autism and move their hands into the position, do a more hands-on approach to teaching them sign language. And sure enough, the children with autism showed much better learning, um, even more so than the gains seen in typically developing children by using this hands-on approach. So it suggests that there may be something that, that could be gained by, by using those kinds of uh, hands-on approaches and trying to teach particular skills. This may also be good for handwriting. Handwriting is definitely impaired in children with autism. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly crucial to school performance um, and, and, and is a skill that's uh, crucial throughout life. And so we've looked at it in children with autism. We have them sort of copy this, 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 these sentences. And we publish studies that show that children with autism show impaired handwriting compared to typically developing children. And what's more, it's particularly in their sort of what's called letter formation. They're actually, their ability to properly form the letters. And so you see, sort of have some examples there of a child with autism, a typically developing child. And what we've been now thinking about and investigating is, are there some approaches that we can use to improve handwriting in children with autism that increase the proprioceptive feedback? Because if you think about how you teach children how to form letters, again, it's really primarily through imitation. You know, the you either write it on a piece of paper, or you write it on the board, and then the child sort of imitates that action, right? And if we you increase proprioceptive feedback, we were thinking about potentially some robotic devices that would sort of would 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 manipulate the hand. Also, even maybe just more basic stencils or things like that that really provide this increased haptic proprioceptive feedback that might help to improve the handwriting in these children and letter formation in these children. And there's some studies that have been done in typically developing children, young typically developing children, suggest that this is effective, and it very, it very well may be particularly effective in children with autism. The, the other thing, though, is if you think about, the other point I want to make about this is if you think about social skills, proprioceptive, increasing proprioceptive feedback may not work because, yes, for particular gestures such as sign language or waving goodbye or things like that, very discreet gestures, you could use some pr increased proprioceptive feedback. But if you're just looking for sort of their ability to learn how to perform these sort of more subtle and complex social communicative gestures, oh, and, and with that, their ability to understand those things in others, then that really comes through imitation. And, and so it may be that we have to think about how to work around it. One, one thing that I think a lot of children with autism sort of just end up relying on is some form of declarative work around that they they have this problem of learning these things more automatically. They, they just rely more on imitate, I'm uh, sorry, excuse me, more on um, memorization. Um, um, and I would submit that in ABA instruction, I think that's a lot of what's going on, is that there's sort of more of this explicit, discreet, trial by trial instruction on how to do, how to perform particular actions that, um, whether that be eye contact or social gestures, that m most of us just sort of learn, quote unquote, naturally that we just learn by, by watching others and, and, and developing those action models, that, that particular therapies sort of rely on this. Um, and we know that, that there are children with autism that do this sort of naturally, that they have excellent memorization and they'll use sort of declarative scripts to compensate for their inability to perform these automatic gestures, and I mentioned ABA as well. The problem with this is, with these kind of approaches, um, is that you're teaching specific actions, there's a lack of context, you know, the rich context that you just gain through imitation, and so therefore the generalizability, this is a buzzword and this is something that certainly ABA is trying to emphasize now, but it, it's still, 
you know, the, this approach does not engender, easily engender generalizability. So what we really want to do is we really ideally want to remodel the way that these children are learning these kinds of uh, skills and how they're forming their action models and see if we can get them to rely more on visual feedback to, to, um, to learn these kinds of skills. So we're thinking about a, two diff a few different approaches at this point um, to increase this frontal parietal mirror neuron system uh, connectivity. One is sort of external stimulation, frankly just their ability to um, just, just use some kind of brain stimulatory methods to try to upregulate um, these visual premotor connections. Um, and so we're considering some of that. Ideally though, to me the best approaches would be behavioral. Is there, are there behavioral approaches that really can improve their visual motor integration, their visual motor learning, and somehow then get them to be, you know, beginning at a very early age, and somehow get them to, to learn better through imitation. Um, I'm going to show this video quick. The other thing is that I want to talk on, and this is, this is from a fellow in this laboratory, he's going to be moving on, um, but he, and I'm just going to touch on this quickly, but this is something that he's had started to look at in, um, in very young children um, at three months of age, and that's something called sticky mittens. So, so at three months of age, children are not able to grasp objects in their environment. They just don't have the motor skills to do so. Interestingly, also at three months of age, children, typically developing children, don't pay very much attention to faces. They don't show a preference when they're looking around to looking at faces of humans versus, versus looking at objects. Okay? So what he did was he put these sticky mittens on three-month-olds. And that allowed them now to suddenly be able to grasp objects in their environment. Um, because they, because the, the mittens are sticky and then the objects are sticky, and suddenly, I'm not going to show a video, but suddenly they can, uh, in the interest of time, they can grasp these objects. And then there's a control group where they can't, they, they just sort of move the objects around and they don't have sticky mittens. Um, and that's called the object dance. And so what's, what's interesting is if you look at, when they then show stimuli, after doing this for a couple of weeks, um, like a 10, 15 minutes a day for a couple of weeks. When you, when you look at then um, face versus toy preference, and then they sort of show them, um, they sit them down, the children, the babies down, and they show them faces and toys. And you look at whether they show preference. At four months of age, the typically developed, these are all typically developed children, the children show preference for faces, that's, that's what we expect. The three-month-old controls who got no therapy, they don't show a preference. And the three-month-old controls who got this object dance control therapy, they don't show a preference for faces. But, oh, this will get there. The sticky mittens group does. So what I would suggest, and I've suggested this to Klaus from the time he first presented this, I saw him present this like, oh God, two and a half years ago or so. Um, is what may be happening is that because these children are, are push towards engaging the external world, engaging objects in the external world. That then, they, they walk away from that and then they start to sort of engage objects in the external world on their own. And what are the most salient objects in the external world? Faces. And so that maybe this is a way that I would say, uh, maybe beginning even in infancy, but certainly then even throughout life, that we could sort of, using these kind of approaches, we could possibly change the way, way these action models are being formed in children with autism and possibly then, and so he's starting to sort of try to pilot this in children with autism as well um, and start to look at this in children with autism. There are no results on that yet. Um, to see whether or not we can um, get, you know, change the, the connections in children, in brain connections in children with autism so that they're better engaging visual systems to guide their motor behavior and, and, and engage in motor learning. So I'm going to finish up by showing this cute picture of my children, and this is actually now three years old. I got to give you an updated picture, but um, or nearly three years old. Um, but um, but it's cute, so I keep using it <laughs> anyway. And then various people have contributed to this work um, uh, throughout this institute and other institutes. So thank you very much. Sorry I went a little bit over. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to. Introduce you.